This is the Bringing Business to Retail podcast with today's guest, one of the top 10 e-commerce commentators, Chloe Thomas. Welcome to the Bringing Business to Retail podcast on selenanight.com. Stay ahead of the competition by opening your doors to business experts so you can learn, grow, and be inspired. Passionate about bringing business strategies to independent retailers, please welcome your host, Selena Knight. Hey there, and welcome to this week's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. I'm Selena Knight, the retail strategist, and you are in the right place if you would like to increase your sales by 25%. Yep, that's what I am saying. Today, I am going to introduce you to an amazing woman called Chloe Thomas, and she's going to show you how, by just listening to this podcast and taking some specific action, you can increase your sales by 25%. Yep, putting it out there, putting the cards on the table and saying it can be done. Now, Chloe is an amazing person. And as I mentioned in the intro, she has been named one of the top 10 e-commerce commentators. So she knows her stuff. And I'm putting it out there to say that what you're going to learn in this episode can be life-changing. Yep, big call I know, but... But you will just have to listen to this episode and see if it lives up to all the hype. Now, on today's episode, Chloe is going to talk to us all about email marketing and e-commerce. She's going to give us a surprising stat, which will, it's a jaw dropping. It's going to be the thing that makes you seriously rethink your whole marketing strategy. She's going to tell you what you should actually be putting in emails to make people want to open them. And we dig down into the juicy details about whether or not you should be carrying out email cleansing. That is taking people off your newsletter database just because they haven't bought anything. Even better, we talk about emotional unsubscribing. So even though people are staying on your list, they've checked out, they've left the building, they are not in love with your brand anymore. So we're talking about so many things that can significantly change your email marketing strategy, can get your customers more engaged, can save you money, can make you money. What more could you want from one single podcast? Now, today's podcast episode is brought to you by my customer lifetime value calculator. It is something that is so important when you're looking at your email marketing. It is just one piece of the marketing strategy that can help you work out where, when, and how you should be marketing to your ultimate customer. And you can have it for free over at selenanight.com forward slash lifetime. Grab it and then jump in and listen to this episode, put it all together and go and make a bunch of money and make your customers happy in the process. Okay, let's jump into the episode with Chloe Thomas. Hey there, and welcome to this week's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. When it comes to e-commerce, email marketing, it can be really difficult to work out what you should be putting in those emails. There's a big argument between transactional emails, I like to call those buy my stuff emails, and educational or informational emails. And I thought, who else better to have on the show than the lady who has been called the top, one of the top 10 e-commerce commentators in the world Chloe Thomas. Welcome to the show, Chloe. Hi, Selena. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me on. That's a pretty awesome title to have. It's quite cool, isn't it? And I'll, I'll be honest, I was a little bit humbled when that happened. And I did kind of like, I did, you know, there's those days when, some, when an email comes in and you just have to step away from the keyboard and grin at yourself. <laughs> I had <laughs> did, one did of those moments. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did my equivalent, the happy dance. Yeah. Which, uh, which uh, was more just kind of a grin inanely at the wall. Um, which I should say I'm facing the wall. I didn't find go and walk to a wall and grin at it. Um, but yeah, yeah. There, and there exactly. was some there was some notable people on that list. You told me. Yeah, yeah. Rand Fishkin uh, was on the list. He's a bit of an SEO or he's a hero of mine. He's such such an awesome speaker and uh, such a clever guy. He's the guy behind Moz uh, in the SEO world. So um, so yeah, that that was that was kind of like that doubled the amount of time I spent grinning at the wall. <laughs> So I feel pretty confident that the information that you're going to share with us today comes with not only a great deal of knowledge, 
but also probably quite a lot of practice. So tell us how you ended up in the world of e-commerce marketing. Well, it was it was accidental. I'll be honest. Um, a series of accidental decisions. I I left. Well, during my uni course, I decided I didn't want to have to go home for the summer, so I wanted to find myself an internship and ended up in the world of marketing for banks, which was quite dull. Uh, but they offered me a job after uni, so I ended up working in banking for about eighteen months. By which point, I had to escape. And the first people who offered me a job was a UK high street retailer who ran a big mail order catalog operation who were called Pastimes, and they had they had catalogs all over the world. Actually, we even had one in Japanese, which is before I got there, but they did have one in Japanese. And there, I got addicted to data because I was looking after the catalog mailings. And from that, that was in 2005. That then expanded in my remit, expanded into emails and store loyalty cards, basically anything to do with customer data. After that, I went on to work for a consultancy as their head of e-commerce, working across about six, seven different uh, mail order and retail brands, just at the point where everyone was sending their first emails. So it was like, it was a bit like being the kid in the candy shop because I got to um, I got to go and meet a new client and say, hey, have you ever sent an email? No, no, we've said, never sent an email. How much data have you got? Oh, I don't know. Let's look it up. Oh, I've got 60,000 opted in email addresses. <laughs> would that make me money? Yes, that probably would make you money. Um, you know, and then, then send the email and have the owner of the business looking over your shoulder as literally as the pounds just roll in because the customers have got so excited. I was going to say, back um, before we all got spammed with, you know, multiple, multiple in- inbox fulls of emails every single day. Yeah, and it was, it was just... Um, it, yeah, it was, it was an awesome time. And from then on, I've just had the bug. Uh, and that I've got, I got, I've got very into things like Google AdWords and Facebook ads as well. But email just remains, remains where my heart is. I have to say, because uh, it's it's such a powerful channel for for retail. It's on average, it's about twenty five percent of a retailer's sales will come from their email marketing, which, which is which is awesome because it's a channel you have control of and which you can do some really cool things with. But it's also quite scary because of the number of businesses certainly I come across who are either forgetting to email their database because they've run out of the, out of time during the week, which is sin number one, or sin number two, all they do is batch and blast. And they never create an automated campaign, not even an abandoned basket. And, you know, that's some of the biggest retailers in the UK have not even done anything more than batch and blast, same message to everybody once a week. And so there's so much potential. It's such a huge channel for sales and there's so much potential, which is why, as you can probably tell, I'm quite passionate about it. I know. And you said 25%. And I was just thinking, literally just before we hopped on to record this interview, I got a text message from one of my clients who we've been building up her email list and she, you know, she doesn't have a lot of people, probably less than a thousand people. And I've been saying to her, you need to send out your, your Mother's Day email. And she did. And she just said, it took me ages and 50 people opened it. And I've already done $500 in sales. And I said to her, oh, my goodness, like two hours work, $500. Like only that. 50 people <laughs> opened it. I would take that every day of the week. <laughs> yeah, and the, and the thing to say to anyone in that situation is your, the first emails you do, they do take that bit longer. You keep doing that for six, for three, four months and it'll take you an hour to do it and you'll be doing it better. So the sales volume will go up as well. So it, it's, a, it's a channel which just keeps on giving, I think. Okay. Before we jump into what you should stick into an email, I have to ask yeah. you about email list cleansing because I'm kind of of the opinion that you know most of the people I deal with don't have 100,000 people on their newsletter list. They've probably got somewhere between five and 50,000 and they hate spending the money going up to the next level of their (laughs) mailing list plan. You know, I I seriously want to slap them across the back of the head when they do this. So they just decide to delete anybody who hasn't opened an email for, you know, a couple of months. What's your take on cleansing your email list? Okay. Um, in my, my own list, so I'll tell you what I do with mine because this is, um, I, I guess that's kind of like the, the ultimate of what you should do is I keep a track on who's engaging with my emails. And if 
if someone's failing to engage, so they're not op- they've not opened for six months, let's say, and they've not bought in that time, and they've not signed up to anything new in that time, then I basically stop mailing them unless I've got something really, really awesome to tell them about, like the you know the the retail equivalent of a January sale. Then I'll send it out to the whole whole list. But you should, you know it's not just about the people who unsubscribe it's about the people who emotionally unsubscribe from your list and if they've stopped opening and they stopped paying attention and if you're not a seasonal business because if you're um i said six months uh, earlier in the answer and if you are a business who sells a lot at christmas six months is not the right time span to look look at 13 months because you want to you don't want to to um, stop mailing to people who want to buy from you at Christmas because they didn't buy, they didn't open your emails in July. That would be insane. Uh, so, so you've really got to look at what the what the engagement level is to work out who you're going to mail to. Then now that is very different from who you choose to delete or not delete. Prior to May 25th, 2018, which is you can probably all tell I'm British, therefore I'm stuck in the world of GDPR. Prior to that, I would have said never delete any of your data ever because you are compiling information about that person and you are learning more and they may come and opt back in and become re-engaged and you want that historical data so you can better market to them in the future. So prior to then, I would have said hold on to everything. In the GDPR world, we're now stuck in in Europe, we have to delete every now and again. So uh, we're still kind of working out what that means because the law isn't clear on what we have to delete. But um, but we're now having to, to work out what we have to delete because we legally have to have to only retain data for certain periods of time. So did that, that, that felt like quite a ramble. Did I answer your question then? <laughs> you did, you did. But I also was just sitting here, you were talking and I was just sitting here thinking about those people who just delete without asking like I, I i sort of feel like when you do that it's like saying to somebody who's walking in a physical store just walking in and they're not buying anything hold on you came in here yesterday and you didn't buy anything i'm sorry you're not to come back in again <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think if you're going to delete in order to stay beneath the threshold um i would say is that really worth your time effort and energy probably not uh because, you know, it's going to, yeah, anyway, I, I was about to get into law of diminishing returns around and nobody needs that. So I would be very careful with what you choose to delete. Now, most most um, of the platforms, when it comes to their thresholds, they don't care. They don't count the people who've unsubscribed in your total number anyway. So deleting your unsubscribes is a waste of time because that's not going to help help you keep under the threshold. So for those under the threshold, you really need to do some analysis of who you should be deleting. And if it's someone who hasn't read one of your emails, opened or clicked in the last two years, then by all means, if it's really important for you to save those few dollars a month, then delete. But I would... Um, I wouldn't do it purely to stay below a threshold unless that threshold was going to cost me more than a thousand a thousand a year. I was just sitting here thinking the thresholds generally tend to be somewhere between 20 and 50 dollars depending on who your provider is. We're talking one sale off an email list to pay for that. Yeah. You know, if you have an average sale of 30 to 40 dollars, you only need one one somebody to click through and buy to actually keep that person on the list. Yeah, and I think often we end up fantas- of not fantasizing, focusing on things like the volume of our email data in order to keep below a threshold because we're avoiding something we really should be doing. It feels like a procrastination <laughs> task to me. So it's you know it's kind of busy work to make you feel like you've achieved something in the day which hasn't actually done anything at all to increase the profitability and i say that advisedly the profitability not just the sales of your business because usually the time it's going to take you to identify who you need to delete and to delete them and to procrastinate probably about that task as well is time you could have spent doing a bit of optimization on your google adwords or tweaking something in your welcome campaign or your abandoned baskets that would yield you far more than that month on month on month on month just sending out one email that you, well, yeah, exactly. you were saying that the, the figures show 25% of your revenue should be mm-hmm. coming from your from your email list. Now that's data, just to qualify it for the data junkies who are listening, it, from a company called Castora in the USA who occasionally produce and always used to produce an analysis where they take 
all the traffic information from a whole host, thousands of e-commerce sites and bundle it all together to produce these awesome reports. The 25% is from, I think it was November 2016, because that's the last data I could get out of them. But it had consistently been between 20 and 25% of sales were driven from email marketing. And that's what it had been for several years before that. So we're talking 20 to 25% of the average e-commerce stores sales come from email marketing and then um, SEO, direct traffic and paid ads are about 20, 20, 20, each of those. And then everything else is teeny tiny after it. So your, and your email is the, is the most awesome of those channels because it's the one which you have control of and you should be getting a better ROI on it than you get on anything else as well. So, so it's a no brainer. I was just saying, so let's just put this in perspective. Say your business is turning over half a million dollars, five hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. If you are failing to send out consistent, good quality emails, I just got my calculator out because I'm not very good with numbers off, off the top of my head, but that's a hundred and twenty five thousand dollars <laughs> you're leaving on the table. Yeah. That's huge. That's a hundred and twenty five thousand dollars that could potentially be pure profit because you've and- done you, you you're not paying out to bring those people in. You're not paying your Google AdWords, you're not paying your Facebook ads. These are people who are already on your list who have indicated that they want to buy your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, it puts the whole getting worried about the extra $20 a month for your, the size of your list into perspective, really, doesn't it? It does. It does. <laughs> all right. So tell us, with all this data that we have, we call it data here in Australia, with all this data that you have, with all the people, all the businesses that you're exposed to, what do you find is the perfect frequency to be sending out email newsletters and email marketing campaigns? Oh, the evil email question. (laughs) Um, I believe that you should send emails at a frequency where you have something interesting to say to the customer. You know, it's not a case of going, oh, we must send uh, once a week, as Chloe said, we should send once a week. It's a case of, do you have something interesting to say to the customer? And most businesses have something interesting to say on a bi-weekly or weekly basis. You know, it's, but, but don't go go thinking, oh my God, we've got nothing to send and I must send an email this week. If you've got nothing interesting to send, it's not going to get the great results you want. So I would say somewhere, depending on the size of your business, depending on the, the stuff that's going on in your business between once a month and once a week, um, more than that, and it tends to be overkill, unless you're a really big business uh, with, you know, where you've, you've, you've done the analysis and you know it's really worth sending excessively. Um, I wouldn't go less than once a month because at that point people forget who you are, which leads them to be more likely to hit the complaints, the spam button, which is terrible for your deliverability. So minimum once a month, even if all you sell sell is at Christmas, you still need to go out once a month between January and October. And then you're probably aiming to get to something like once a week, just because as you were saying with the example of your customer who sent out the, uh, the Mother's Day email, the rewards are just so great. It's it's frequently one of the best returns on the investment of your time that you can make is to make sure you're sending out an email once a week. Okay, so the next question that people yeah. are going to be thinking to ask Chloe, they're like, Sal, just ask Chloe, I can hear them, is what the freaking heck do I stick in the email? Is it just <laughs> the top five products that I'm having? Because you know, I, I, I prefer personally, with retail, especially independent retail, I love to read stuff rather than just products. I want to see, you know, who's behind the scene. I love those behind the scenes emails. Um, there's a company called Chubbies, which, which do these really funky, bright, 80s style shorts in America. I would never wear them. I don't have the legs for them. But I love subscribing to their email because they've got like fun facts for the weekend. They send out their email on a Friday and it's like, you know, three things you could do this weekend. And they're always really cool. They're really fun. And even though I don't buy their product, I I stay on their mailing list as a marketing junkie (laughs) because I love what they send out. So tell me, with all all this knowledge that you have, what do you find, you know, is there a mix? Is it one or the other? Like what works? What gets you that 25% revenue that people are going, I want that? Okay, I, I warn you, I could go on for several hours on this topic. Um, help, helping people beat their broadcasting 
block, you know, what to put in my emails is something I'm quite, I, I, I spend quite a lot of time talking about. So I will try and keep this bullet pointy for you all. So the first thing to do is to have an app to set yourself up with a calendar of what you're going to be sending. Get So basically get organized, create a spreadsheet with a box per week of the year and work out what you're going to send in each of those weeks. And what you will find is that, you know, last order dates for Christmas, January sale, Mother's Day, bank holidays, Australia Day, July the 4th, whatever the big events are in your country and for your customers, you will find actually probably a third to half of those weeks get filled up with that. So it's like, all right, okay, so those are kind of no-brainer weeks as to what I'm going to send or what the subject of what I'm going to send is. And then that that leaves you with only only a much smaller number of weeks to actually have to get um, inspired about. So that I find that tends to make the whole, oh, my God, what am I going to say, feel a little bit simpler because it doesn't feel like you've got to come up with ideas for the next 52 weeks. It comes up more like I've got to find an idea for this week and then next week I'm on to Easter, so we're fine. Um, so that's that's my first tip is get organised and get yourself a calendar. Then we've kind of got the banker emails, okay? The really, the ones which are always going to bring in the money. These will be your best sellers, you know, top five best sellers. Because as humans, we like to do what other people have already done because it makes us, you know, it takes away some of the risk. It makes it easy for our brain to process. There's all kind of good psychological reasons for this. But best sellers will work. If you tell people, here are our top five best sellers of this season, you will sell a shed load from that email. Um, Social proof should be in every single email so that customer testimonials, review scores, all that sort of thing. Every single email you send out should have some element of that in it, even if it's just a simple testimonial in the footer every single time, because that will psychologically improve response. By the same token, you could then combine social proof with the best sellers idea and create an email that is our top reviewed, our customers love the most, these products. That's like catnip um, to, to humans. Um, so to your customers, it's like catnip. So you've got this whole, our customers love this. So pick the products that have got the best review scores across your business and send an email about that. Those are kind of like, those are the bankers, the quick, easy ones. Sale, obviously you want to split that up. So you're going to have sale now on, uh, sale must end, soon sale price is reduced there's lots of different things you can do with the sale message to get people to come and buy from that that's always a good email um and and so you know, have i got time to tell people of a little tip i've got to give them to help them understand what the customer wants to hear from them about go for it they, they want okay. to hear this stuff okay cool so what you were saying about chubbies and that human connection i think is essential in this day and age we have we have so much landing in our inbox. We have so many things competing for our attention. And if we don't feel a personal connection to something, to a business, to their products, then we're considerably less likely to pay attention to it and be interested in it. So building that human connection that people want to see and want to engage with is really important. That means kind of coming out from behind the curtain and revealing a bit of yourself and a bit of your business. And often, you know, because we're so close to it, it's really hard to work out what people actually want to hear about, about us and about our business. So this tip is one which I've been using uh, with clients for quite some time now, and it continues to deliver really awesome results. So what you do is you do a survey of your customers where you ask them a couple of questions, um, you know, just quick tick box stuff of stuff you think it'd be interesting to know. But the really important one is to ask a question about why they buy your product to try and inspire them to write you a really long answer. Okay, we, this is not tick box stuff. This is not number analysis stuff. You want lots of words. So, for, for example, the first client I did this with is a company who sell or who broker holidays in cottages in the area of England where I live, which is called Cornwall. And so we asked the question, why do you come to Cornwall on holiday? Now, people my God, I could not believe how much they wrote. <laughs> we got so much data back on this. So many words. Now, you take all those words of all these answers from your customers and you put them into a word cloud tool. So there's loads. Just Google it. There are loads of these that are free. And what that does is it creates a visual image of those words. And the larger the word, the more times that word's been used. OK, simple. Once you've got that, print it out and stick it on the wall because now you know what your customers 
want to hear about about your product, what they love most about the sort of thing you do. So if in the Cornwall example, we're a peninsula, so we're surrounded by the sea on three sides. People come to us for their summer holidays and the big word across the middle of the word cloud was beaches. And we hadn't sent any emails about beaches in over 12 months because we live in Cornwall. No. Who cares about the beaches? <laughs> so it was, it was kind of one of those, oh my God. That's what the customer wants to hear from us about. So we started sending emails about beaches and cottages on beaches and all the rest of it. And it made a big old difference. So that's that's kind of my my favorite little method for getting your customers to tell you what they want in their emails. Ah, that's a bit of a Ryan Levesque thing, the ask method. <laughs> it is. I read his book after, but I love his book. Very, you were very thinking, good. I'm doing that already. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm doing that already. But that's that's the best business books, aren't they? They're like Maybe 50%, oh, I'm already doing that. And 50%, oh, why didn't I think of that? I know, and some of it, it's just like forward slapping moment. It's like, oh, that sounds like so obvious, but why didn't I think of that? Yeah, and, and, and I, I would like to say my method is a bit simpler than Ryan's because you're not spreadsheeting it. You're just lumping it all together and putting it in a word cloud, which takes a lot less time. Yeah, it's it's funny, like you said, how people, when you're in your own business, you, you don't think of these things. I was talking with a client. Um, we're actually doing her email sequences for her. And I said, you know, we we're talking about who her customer was and all that kind of stuff, just trying to get some information. And I said to her, look, I don't know why this has popped into my head, but I really feel like your people, I haven't done the research, but I've done a lot of this kind of stuff. Your people are going to connect with Pete Evans. Now he's, a, I don't know if you have him over in the UK, but he's like a paleo TV celebrity chef. Oh, okay. And, um, and she's like, oh, yeah, Pete we delivered our products to his wedding. Like they were featured in a magazine. <laughs> we were down at Pete's pool the other day. <laughs> I was like, you know, it's one of those moments where it's like, you know, a little pat on the back to myself because, yeah. you know, clearly I was able to correlate that. I'm like, so, so you, you've told people about this, right? You told people that your product was uh, featured in a, in a major glossy magazine and that clearly it's associated with him. And, you know, I figured that your people would want to hear about it. She's like, no, do people want to know about that? <laughs> and like you said, you know, the, the people want to be associated with celebrity. They want to be associated with yeah. those top five products. They want to have the thing that everybody else has. Otherwise, they might miss out. Yeah, oh, completely. Uh, yeah, it, 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 and it's amazing when you – I find that when I get people to sit down and do the calendar – and then they start thinking about, oh, what could we talk about? And they, you know, just getting kind of getting away from the desk and focusing on something a bit different. It just does remind you, oh, yeah, we had that magazine thing. And and what having the calendar can be quite good about is if, you know, you're in the middle of the January sale and you get a load of great press, well, you're not going to send that out during the January sale. But if you've got your calendar, you can write it in for February so you don't forget. So it becomes a way of, you know, remembering good stories and where best to fit them in rather than just being so knee jerk all the time. Yes. And, and the stories, are, like you said, the stories are the connection. That same client I was telling you about, they help artists with their, you know, with, they, they buy designs from artists to help them. And she was telling me a story about how one of the artists, you know, her goal was to, to buy a house. I'm like, right, there's an email sequence. Help this lady <laughs> buy a house. <laughs> she's like, I, I don't know if she would feel comfortable with that. I'm like, get on the phone and ask her because I'm sure she wants the house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. She wants the house. But it's that connection, isn't it? It's like, if, you know, I was going to buy your product anyway, but now I can feel really good about buying your product and know that I'm helping somebody yeah. achieve their dreams. Yeah, and it, it's, you know, the more, the more human connection you can put in, the more social proof you can put in, um, the better it's, it's going to be for your business because people want that connection. Okay, so you've convinced people that they need to be sending out these emails on a somewhere between one once a week and once a month basis. If they're feeling yep. confident, they've mapped it all out. What are the next sequences that you really encourage people to put together? Okay, number one in e-commerce is your abandoned baskets campaign. Uh, that is just an absolute no-brainer quite frankly. So this is the campaign which will capture the email just as someone as they go through the checkout and then send them emails to uh, remind them to come back and buy. Uh, it could be one email, it could be multiple emails. These tend to be a fantastic revenue generator. These days, there are so many cool little widgety plug -y tools that you can just add in to either your email system or onto your website that do the whole thing for you that, um, that they're just, they used to be 
God, they used to be an absolute nightmare because of all the integration. You know, it would be like a six month project to get an abandoned basket campaign set up by the time you've got everything talking to each other and working and tested. These days, the fact you can just turn it on continues just to just to boggle my brain, quite frankly. But uh, but yeah, so that's quite a quick and easy one. Um, I think that's all I'll say on that one, just because it really does depend on the plugins you're using and they really are really quick and easy. So there's oh, no I excuses just, not, not doing it. Can I just jump in and say, as yeah. the person who often puts things in my cart and gets to check out, never has their purse nearby. So then has to wander off to the kitchen or the bedroom, what has to find my purse first. And in the meantime, somebody's managed to hurt themselves or drop something or <laughs> you know, the dog's vomited on the floor, whatever. I've forgotten why I was even, what I was looking for, let alone finding my purse. And then, you know, I've shut the computer. I open it up the next day. What was I doing here? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm okay with sending me that email because I actually wanted that stuff. I just forgot. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing, you know, there's so many distractions. It's not like we're stood in a physical store with a basket full of stuff or an arm full of clothes walking to the checkout life happens when you're when you're trying to buy online um you know and even more so when you're trying to buy on mobile so yeah they're the customers will generally appreciate them um so those of you who are scared of of sending one out go on give it a try you'll see the money rolling in and then you'll just be completely bought in i promise <laughs> all right what's next next is the welcome campaign oh i love a welcome campaign it's probably my favorite of all so um this would be combined with pop-ups to actively gain email addresses. So increase your email list and then use your welcome campaign to convert them into customers. The reason I love this combination, well, it's twofold really. One, was it something like 90, at least 95% of people come to your website and don't buy. So why not get the email address off them? It's considerably easier to get an email address from an interested person than it is to get money from an interested person. So get the email address and then create a sequence of emails. Might be one, could be 10, depends on how much you need to tell, need and want to tell them, um, that explains why they should buy from you. So it's gonna include all that great content we were talking about earlier, building that emotional connection with your business, telling them about why you started it, how you picked the products, what you care about, you know, the stories of if you're helping someone to buy a house uh, and all the rest of all this great content together with plenty of social proof. So um, I've seen some of uh, some of my clients have done it. So they literally have an email which says what the press say about us in their welcome campaign. Others have emails which are here's some of our customer reviews. And that's all that's in the email is just a selection of customer reviews just to, to build that person's relationship and their trust with your business as they go through the welcome campaign. Now, usually I see welcome campaigns convert customers at around the 20 to 25 percent mark. So that means if you get a thousand people onto your list, your welcome campaign is going to convert. Oh, well, now I can't do the maths now. Uh, <laughs> that's worrying this is, this is why Two, i always yeah. have is that 250 let's t times 25 yeah 200 to 250 yeah. that's right isn't it <laughs> see i haven't yet finished my morning coffee that's a problem so if that's going to convert you get a thousand people signed up you're going to get 200 to 250 of them to buy with that welcome campaign and as i said i mean a lot of people fail to do a welcome campaign because they can't work out what to put in it well hopefully the discussion earlier today has helped you work out some of the things to put in it yes the word cloud is going to be important um but the the other thing is a lot of those those emails you're going to create for the welcome campaign are emails you could send out as your regular broadcast as well you know so if you've created an email for the welcome campaign which is uh, what the press say about us that has a selection of articles and comments and reviews from the press about your products why not send that out as one of your broadcasts? You know, so you can get kind of double whammy from the time it takes you to create the email. So you create the email, put it live in your welcome campaign the same week you send it out to everybody on the list. That's a good use of your time. And while you were talking, I just did this five times to make sure it's correct because it's early morning for you and it's late at night for me. Let's say that you did get the thousand people and the 250 converted with a very modest average order value of $50. That's twelve and a half thousand dollars. Yeah. For nothing. You've already set it up. It's all on automatic pilot. Yeah. 
and it just goes and goes and goes. And I suppose actually that's a good thing to say is try and create every single one of those welcome campaign emails as something which will uh, last for at least six months without having to be refreshed. So rather than saying our best selling products, say our best selling categories, because that tends to have a bit more longevity to it. So uh, so a few tweaks like that mean you don't have to refresh your welcome campaign too often, which means it just churns money for you. That's nice, nice. And I know that um, on my team, my, my amazing marketing assistant, marketing manager, Monica just did an email campaign for a client and I think something like within six weeks, it generated $30,000 to a very modest list as well. I think the list was only about (laughs) (laughs) 5,000. So, you know, just just because they hadn't been doing it. And by the time she put the sequence together for for that client, for us, um, yeah, who's going to say no to (laughs) $30,000? Not me. Yeah, exactly. Bring it on. (laughs) All right. So you've obviously got a lot to share with people. And I know that you have written a book about this. So tell us a little bit about the book because I'm really interested to hear what's inside of it. Okay, so um, the book you're referring to is called Customer Persuasion, How to Influence Your Customers to Buy More and Why an Ethical Approach Will Always Win. And everything, thinking about it, yeah, everything we've been talking about today is within that book. Um, it's It introduces my model of the customer master plan, which is e-commerce broken down into six circles and five arrows, which takes you from uh, the point at which someone knows nothing about you through to the point at which they buy from you again and again and again through various customer relationship levels. And then the book focuses on how to move people from between each of those customer relationship levels. So it's all about basically building loyalty from day one through to the end of their journey with you and how to get as much money as possible out of those customers. And it's full of huge amounts of practical advice. Um, in fact, let me let me read you out one of the reviews because I've got it in front of me. <laughs> this, is from, this is from Ian Jindal, who's um, the editor of Internet Retailing in the UK, which is our biggest, um, our biggest, most prestigious industry source of news, I suppose. And he says, it's a compendious, compendious overview of the selling processes online, all from the position of an ethical and authentic connection with the customer. So there you go. Loads of ideas in there. Um, I have feedback from people that it gives them far too big a to-do list, but I take that as a, as a good thing, not a bad thing. And it's available as ebook, audiobook, and paperback on all the Amazon platforms. And if you want to get a taster of it, you can get the first two chapters for free at customerpersuasion.co.uk. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Just a little taster. Maybe put a couple of the things into play and so you can see just how effective it is. Exactly. And if people want to know more about you, about all of this, this wisdom, inspiration, knowledge, where can they find you? You can find out everything about me. Well, not everything. That would be a bit excessive. Everything in the e-commerce space about me at uh, ecommercemasterplan.com. There you'll find details about all my books, about my podcast, about uh, the courses I offer, what I do with my clients and, um, and lots of great advice for free as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that on the show. I'm sure that people can take just a little bit of this information, put it into place, and hopefully they'll see the dollars rolling in super quick. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. You can find all of the show notes over at selenanight.com. If you found something that you heard today particularly useful, I'd love it if you could leave me a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And of course, feel free to share this episode with someone that you think could benefit by listening to it. Want more retail biz strategies? You can watch the Bringing Business to Retail TV show where each week I'll answer a question or provide you with a simple, actionable retail biz strategy that you can implement in your business right away. If you have a question or a guest, I'd love to hear from you. Drop my team an email at podcast at selenanight.com and I'll see you on the next episode. Have a great week.